Take a dose of seaweed or burnt sea sponge twice a year. That was the ancient Chinese remedy for goiter. Almost 4,000 years ago, Chinese medical writings described the troublesome swelling of the neck we know as goiter and noted the remedy which had somehow been arrived at through trial and error. Later, Hippocrates and Galen gave the same recommendation, and by the 12th century, the treatment was taught in the school of Salerno, one of the first formal medical schools. <clears throat> Finally, in 1820, Jean-Francois Condé showed that the active principle of the burnt sponge remedy was iodine and demonstrated that goiter decreased in size when an alcoholic tincture of iodine was administered. By the middle 1800s, it had become clear that the incidence of goiter varied geographically and that the critical feature was the iodine content of the food that was consumed. Crops grown near the sea had sufficient iodine, but people who subsisted on food grown inland, such as the goiter belt in the U.S., had a high incidence of goiter. Eventually, the addition of iodine to salt solved the problem. However, remember that Himalayan salt, sea salt, and kosher salt are not iodized. The role of iodine began to be clarified in 1896 when Eugene Bauman showed that iodine was present in the thyroid gland. Then in 1914, Calvin Kendall isolated thyroxin, a thyroid hormone that turned out to be extremely important in regulating metabolism as well as in kidney and brain function. A lack of thyroxin in babies dooms them to cretinism, marked by severe mental and physical retardation. In adults, an underactive thyroid causes weight gain, mental slowness, depression, and fatigue. And what about the connection to goiter? If there's not enough iodine in the diet, the thyroid works overtime to extract as much as possible from the bloodstream and increases in size. But not all thyroid problems are related to iodine deficiency. In Hashimoto's disease and in Graves' disease, the body's immune system mistakenly attacks the thyroid, causing respectively underactivity and overactivity. Luckily, there is a solution. In the early 1900s, desiccated animal thyroid extracts were used to treat an underactive thyroid. But then in 1926, thyroxin, a molecule that contains four iodine atoms was synthesized in the lab by biochemist Charles Harrington, making possible the treatment of thyroid problems with a standardized drug. In the case of an overactive thyroid, drugs such as carbimazole or propothiouracil can stop the thyroid from producing any hormone, and then appropriate amounts can be restored by giving the patient thyroxin. Radioactive iodine can also be used to destroy part of the thyroid, or it can be surgically removed, followed again with an appropriate dose of thyroxin. Some patients complain that they don't feel quite right and lack energy with thyroxin. And there may be a reason for this. <clears throat> thyroxin, once released from the thyroid, has one of its iodine atoms removed by an enzyme and is converted into a more potent hormone known as T3. Some researchers believe that an oral combination of thyroxin and T3 is the way to go, but the jury is still out on that one. In any case, we have come a long way since the ancient Chinese recommended burning sponges to treat goiter. That for today is our Kappa Joe.